This is a Quartz Ideas piece. After a week in which President Donald Trump warned that the U.S. could totally destroy North Korea in defending itself or allies, the administration on Thursday, September 21, issued an executive order imposing a series of new sanctions on businesses that deal with the nuclear weapon armed country. North Korea, for its part, threatened highest level action which the country's foreign minister unreassuringly clarified could include detonating a hydrogen bomb in the Pacific. North Korea has continued with the development of its weapons programs despite the imposition of more and more severe primary sanctions, directed at people and entities of the targeted country. That's why politicians on both sides of the aisle and commentators of all stripes have been clamoring for the U.S. to impose what are known as secondary sanctions. Secondary sanctions target non-U.S. companies that engage in otherwise lawful transactions outside the U.S. with parties from the sanctioned nation. So, for example, if a Malaysian bank does business with North Korean nationals and companies in Malaysia, then no U.S. bank can do business with that Malaysian bank, even if the transaction between the U.S. and Malaysian banks has no nexus whatsoever to North Korea. And of equal importance that Malaysian bank can no longer do any business in the U.S. This week's executive order takes the U.S. one step closer to the imposition of secondary sanctions. Section 4 of the order gives the Treasury Department the discretion to impose sanctions on foreign banks in the U.S. if any of their foreign operations knowingly conduct or facilitate any significant transactions on behalf of any blocked North Korean parties or in connection with trade with North Korea. President Trump summed up the concept, paywall, of secondary sanctions when he reportedly said during a lunch with the leaders of Japan and South Korea. Foreign banks will face a clear choice, doing business with the United States or facilitate trade with the lawless regime in North Korea. Secondary sanctions sound appealing, especially when all actions taken by the U.S. and its allies have so far failed to dissuade North Korean leader Kim Jong-un from lobbing ballistic missiles over Japan in his Dr. Evil-like drive to hold the world to ransom with an increasingly sophisticated nuclear program. Secondary sanctions appear to make for a hardline, yet non-military option, but they present a number of significant downsides. They're not a silver bullet while North Korea often is viewed as a hermit state with few ties to the international community, it in fact enjoys diplomatic and trade relations with a sizable number of countries, most notably China, its chief trade partner, and Russia, as well as Brazil, Germany and Malaysia. The focus of the U.S. secondary sanctions movement, however, has been almost entirely on China, and more specifically, the big Chinese banks that rank among the largest financial institutions in the world. For example, Ed Royce, chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, has argued, paywall, that the U.S. should target major Chinese banks doing business with North Korea. The U.S. Senate Banking Committee held a hearing over the summer titled Secondary Sanctions Against Chinese Institutions, Assessing Their Utility for Constraining North Korea, where much of the testimony and questioning centered on Chinese banks. Former CIA Deputy Director and Treasury official David S. Cohen, who served in the Obama administration, recently argued in favor of implementing secondary sanctions that target Chinese banks. In this age of sound by driven news cycles, no one wants to risk seeming soft on North Korea, but secondary sanctions are not the magic bullet advocates suggest. In fact, secondary sanctions can be deeply problematic and counterproductive. They are unlikely to prove effective and they would destabilize Sino-American diplomatic and economic relations precisely at a time when we need China's sustained help on North Korea. The imposition of secondary sanctions will also result in de-risking by U.S. banks. Secondary sanctions hurt regular people reacting to pressure from various government regulators and private litigants. Banks are rejecting whole swaths of customers based in risky regions and industries, a trend called de-risking. The risking creates real difficulties for businesses and ordinary people for whom getting a bank account is becoming a harder endeavor, while forcing them to turn to informal, and less transparent, channels to move their money. Secondary sanctions can make the problem worse. For example, 
whole communities on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border have been cut off from the banking system because banks want to avoid any unintended connection to illegal drugs or human trafficking. Somalis living and working in the U.S. can no longer remit money home to their families because all U.S. banks have severed any correspondent banking.